Hello, this is the uh, Chapter 1 recorded lecture uh, for HSC 360 and Information Technology for Healthcare Professionals. This will be Chapter 1. And what we're going to really look at is some a lot of information you probably are aware of and, and most of you probably uh, already know. But I need to set a baseline to make sure that everybody um, is on the same plane, plane level. So if we have people that this is new information, then they can get that and we can all start at the same plane level if they will. So this is really looking at all the hardware, software, and some of the basic telecommunications that we'll see within the um, within technology. So information technology, computer computer literacy is information technology includes computers, and uh, um, it includes, includes computers and networks and computer literacy. We'll talk a little bit about that. So computer literacy is really computer is really the knowledge of basic computer concepts. The ability to use those computers to make tasks easier, hopefully, though there's some question about whether that's true or not, and the ability to use the internet and World Wide Web in a functional, sort of productive way. And so that's the first start of this that we're going to look at. Now, the computer obviously is an electronic device which accepts data as an input. It processes that data according to instructions that are stored as memory, and it produces information as output, and then it stores those results. That's how a computer really functions in the simplest form. Far more complicated than that, but that's what it says. So we see here a basic computer. You have your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, and your CPU. Now, computers in healthcare is especially crucial for allied health students to have a knowledge of computers and networks because almost everything is becoming electronic in the healthcare world, and the and so it's all software and hardware, and and much much less is being done by paper uh, day to day. The federal government is attempting to make the use of electronic health record (EHR) and integrate hospital information technology systems universal by 2014, and so it's now 2016. We're still not there yet. So that was the initial intent. So we're we're hoping we get there, um, and, but we're moved along quite a bit. And there's a lot of a lot of perks, if you will, for healthcare systems that go to electronic uh, electronic health records. We have supercomputers. That's the largest and most powerful at any time. They're used for scientific applications such as weather forecasting and, simu and simulations and such. All of those are the are the technique that they're used to really build, or the mechanisms really build and work with very complicated Now, mainframes are a type of computer that are used in large institutions like businesses and hospitals, universities. They're powerful. They accept multi-users, so they take in information from lots of people. They and they can access the main people can access the mainframe frame through their terminals or their computers. And it's used for data processing tasks like generating payroll, processing insurance claims, um, doing a patient medical record, those kind of things. We have mini computers. Those are uh, scaled down mainframes, multi-user. They're used in small businesses like, our, if you will, we have microcomputers like uh, PCs, personal computers, desktops. They're used by individuals. So it's just the different names that are used in this process. We've come to know no, uh, netbooks, and they're scaled down microcomputers. They're light and easy to carry. They provide a link to the internet, and they support some of the common application software, so we don't need that big, heavy computer to carry around. And then we have what were used to be called PDAs or personal personal digital assistants before the days of iPads. They were small handheld computers. So now our phones have taken over that. Our phone has really become the PDA, if you will. And it was used throughout the healthcare system for references to gather information to write prescriptions. But now smartphones have taken that over as well as tablet computers. They've really embraced. They've really been embraced by healthcare providers. Smartphones or cell phones with built-in applications and internet access. They do provide phone service, obviously, and text messaging, email, web browsing, uh, still and video cameras. They have MP3 players and video viewing. And there are many health-related apps for the smartphones that we can use today. This is a good look at a smartphone. Some people would uh, say that uh, the iPhone is better, uh, if you will, than the other kind. But we're, we're you know, basically, it depends what you like. The tablet computers, they're wireless, wireless touchscreen computers, uh, which may use a stylus or a digital pen to input information. And the tablet computers have become widely used in the healthcare world. They really become pretty much a, a, um, a, the focus, if you will, or the use, the input device in the healthcare world. There's a nice looking tablet, and they come in all sorts of brands and sizes and such. 
We have embedded computers. Those are single purpose computers on chips that we have inside appliances or even human beings. They can be used to regulate a heartbeat or dispense medication uh, or uh, to, to monitor all sorts of things inside of an appliance or a human. Now, hardware includes all the physical parts of the computer, the parts you can see and, the, and, and touch, if you will, they're the things that are, that are the, the engine, if you will. It includes all the devices used to input hardware, includes all the devices that are used to digitalize and input data into a computer. And these are, if you look at the process, here's the, the, here's the, the RAM chips, if you will. These, these provide volatile memory. There's the storage information that can be on a disk or a thumb drive or a hard drive. Input uh, devices include keyboards and mouse, if you will. And then output devices can include a monitor, see a picture, and then, of course, a printer to print something in a hard copy. And then you have a processor, your CPU, that, that uh, is the center portion of that. The input devices, like I said, are keyboards. We have some direct injury devices that are pointing devices like a mouse. We have microphones and cameras that all take go put information in the computer. We have scanning devices like a barcode reader, which scans universal product codes, or a Kurzweil scanner, which where text is input, and the voice reading the text aloud is output. So you can it basically reads the information and and uh, and speaks it. We have uh, MICR, a magnetic ink character recognition. We have an OCR, which is an optical character recognition. We have an OMR, optical mark recognition, RFID, a radio frequency identification tag. We'll talk a little bit about that throughout the throughout this course. So processing hardware comprises the brains of the computer. It's the central process unit and also has the memory. Now, central processing unit is a control unit, directs operation, following instructions and programs. It's arithmetic logic, if you will, uh, the, a unit that performs arithmetic operations and logical operations through comparisons. That's how it works. The memory is random access memory, or RAM, is a temporary workspace and it holds current work, but it only stays a lot. It only stays there as long as the 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 instrument is is uh, plugged in or has battery power. Once that goes away, then the, so does the RAM. The read-only memory, the ROM, is permanent. It can be firmware, and it can hold things like startup instructions. Some output devices, the soft copy they call it, are like monitors and voice synthesis. So they put out the monitor, they put something on the monitor, picture, or whatever, a voice synthesis is put out, it puts out a, a, a language or whatever. We have hard copies, which are printers, which can be impact and not impact. We have plotters. All those things are output devices. We can have secondary storage devices like magnetic media. We see in hard disks or disk sets has been replaced by these high capacity medias like CD-ROM things and or, or a thumb drive or, or flash memory they call it. So you know, also a USB drive. So solid state high capacity memory devices. It's interesting that the first I have to tell you this the first hard drive I ever owned was a one megabyte hard drive uh, for a computer in 1984. And it was about the size of a of a loaf of bread. It cost a thousand dollars for one megabyte. And now in my computer, I have 1.7 terabytes, and so a, a thousand megabytes is a gig, and uh, and a hundred megabytes would be a terabyte. So it, when you start adding it all up together, you, you have a lot more ability to develop memory now than we used to. Now, system software manages the hardware, like operating system and utilities and such, like uh, Windows 10 or whatever. That's that's operating software. Application software does the tasks for the user, depending on what we're talking about. Word processors, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel for spreadsheets, Microsoft Access for database management systems, uh, graphics, if you will. You can think of uh, Photoshop, if you will. Communications, you can have a uh, uh, internet browser, you can have uh, uh, something in a software like, for instance, Skype that lets you talk to people over the internet. And then some very specialized packages you can use otherwise. Network of telecommunications, we have to think of connectivity, and that's the fact that that allows computers to link and be sending and receiving data from other sites. And so telecommunications involves the linking of computers from one point to the other. The data media and data must follow some path between connected computers. Connections can be high bandwidth or low bandwidth, be wired, which means they work on a Cat5 or Cat6 wire to a central central uh, server, or they be wireless, which means that they they use a wireless system, uh, Bluetooth in some cases, or wireless to to uh, send it and receive information. 
Hospitals use a hardware system called a T1 line for moving images, and those T1 lines are, are uh, fiber optic lines that run to the hospital and provide a much higher bandwidth. Now, hospitals can use slow connections for email, but for the movement of images, like in PAX units, we move, we move radiology uh, images and things like that, we really need a T1 line. Now, communication software includes technical standards rules that govern communications between computers, and all the directions, if you will, that allow us to talk back and forth in a standardized sort of fashion. Networks allow the sharing of hardware, software, and data, and they, they're classified by size, LANs, WANs, and personal networks, and we'll talk more about that a little later. Now, there's been a great expansion of the wireless technology, and that's an understatement, because we now have all sorts of methodologies to talk back and forth with, uh, without having anything plugged in. Our cell phone is the greatest answer to that. If you, if you don't have a smartphone now, you're one of the exceptions. 80% of people in the United States, 82% actually, have smartphone access. 82%. 18% don't. Now, in 19, 1994, 5% of the population had a cell phone. 5%. In 1998, 26% had access. And so you can see that things have changed significantly, and now almost everybody has a cell phone and, and most of those are smartphones. GPS, a guidance placement system, uh, is a basically a, 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 a thing that identifies where you're at. And we use GPSs in lots of ways. We can attach them to appliances in a hospital so we know where those appliances are. We can attach them to our cell phones so we know where somebody's at. Wi-Fi is really the ability to attach to a on to a, a central system, but it's uh, it's not the same as our cell phone uh, technology, which goes to satellite, but goes to a server, but via the the uh, wireless technology. We talked about PDAs before, our smartphones, and then our tablet computers, which allow us that access. The internet is an interconnected network of networks uh, that spans the world, if you will, and originated in our ARPA. Uh, net in 1969. It subscribes to what's called the TCP IP protocols and it services by exchange of text, data, programs, research, email, medline, telemedicine, telecommunications, telecommuting, all that is part of our internet. Our internet has become quite, quite fantastic when you think about what you're able to do. I have to go back. My daughter, for instance, has an iPhone 5 and she, when she wants to know something, she just tells, talks to Siri on her iPhone and says, Siri, what's the answer? And Siri provides an answer for her. That's a lot different than having to look it up. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it does make us, give us more ready access to information. The World Wide Web, www, which is the first three letters you put uh, when you're looking for a, a URL address, <coughs> is part of the internet that allows the linking of multimedia documents and you must have an internet connection and software called a browser to be able to get that intermediate access. The, the web is the geographical part of the internet. It's comprised of pages with these hyperlinks to other pages so we can click those and take us to other places. It can be searched using a search engine. There's many, many, many different types of search engines available. Everything from Bing to there's Alta Vista, which is still around, uh, lots of others. Every document has an address, a URL. It's called the Uniform Resource Locator which you can enter if you know it, and you can browse and start anywhere and click on any links to other sites, so you can go in any direction you want. And that, what that does is gives you the ability to look at many, many resources, multiple site resources, all at the same time if you choose. Search tools are the search engines, and they allow the user to enter a search expression to find documents with a matching phrase. And their subject guides or directories, which help organize information in categories. All of that allow us to, to sort of filter through the information as we see it. Now, evaluate information. There's no standards governing the quality of information on the internet. Much of it is unreliable. In fact, you have to be very careful because just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's real. I have to go back to a time when I was young where if it was printed in some way, people automatically assumed that whatever was printed was true. And if it was written hand, handwritten, was not as true. It's funny because uh, all that was available then was a typewriter. And uh, so if you typed it out, it was considered to be far more authentic than if you didn't. Nowadays, if you put it on the internet, then it must be authentic because it's on the internet. It's interesting how people have sort of derived that. And the truth is there's, there's, no, uh, there's no way that you can say something's reliable and not reliable uh, except by the, looking at the sources like peer review uh, journals, things like that, that, have a, that, have a, that will tell you they are, they are, the data is accurate and all that kind of thing. So it's a, different, it's a different world we live in. 
Some questions you have to ask with judging reliability of information. Is the site maintained by an educational EDU, nonprofit, ORG, or a government GOV institution? And that makes it different. Is the site maintained by an individual? The address can include anything. Is the site maintained by a commercial organization, .com, that's trying to sell you something? Because if that's the site, then they have no obligation to, to be act to be uh, uh, accurate. And in that truth, uh, with that truth in mind, then um, you can understand that may, what they're saying may or may not be accurate. Does the page have an author? Has the page been updated recently? And I always go to Wikipedia because people will use that for a resource or try to. You can't use those in any of my papers, but um, they go to Wikipedia, and I can go to Wikipedia and change anything I want to any of those sites, and it would be printed that way. Now, I always say Wikipedia is a good place to start for, for doing research because you can go look at, a, at, a, at an area, and you can look at the references that were used to write that paper, and that will give you a start sometimes in research. But you can't use the articles in Wikipedia directly uh, because you don't know if they're accurate or not. Does the information make sense and can it be supported by other sources? In other words, is it, is it validatable? And be careful of conflicts of interest on any site, even the FDA. For example, much of the drug budget for the FDA comes from drug companies that it regulates. So you can't be really sure about things uh, until you compare them. And so learning to discern information, compare information, is really important. Now, I know for some of you this is a, a walkthrough, something you learned probably in grade school. And for some of you, this is other information. And hopefully it filled in some spots. So we've completed our chapter one lecture. And uh, thank you very much.